This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 41 The doctor was an old man, a very nice, kind looking old man when I got him up. I told him me and my brother was over on Spanish Island, hunting yesterday afternoon, and camped on a piece of a raft we found, and about midnight he must have kicked his gun in his dreams, for it went off and shot him in the leg, and we wanted him to go over there and fix it and not say nothing about it, nor let anybody know, because we wanted to come home this evening and surprise the folks. "'Who is your folks?' he says. "'The Phelps is down yonder.' "'Oh!' he says. And after a minute he says, "'How'd you say he got shot?' "'He had a dream,' I says, "'and it shot him.' "'Singular dream,' he says. So he lit up his lantern and got his saddlebags, and we started. But when he seized the canoe, he didn't like the look of her. Said she was big enough for one, but didn't look pretty safe for two. I says, Oh, you needn't be afeard, sir. She carried the three of us easy enough. What three? Why, me and Sid and, and, and the guns, that's what I mean. Oh, he says. But he put his foot on the gunwale and rocked her, and shook his head, and said he reckoned he'd look around for a bigger one. But they was all locked and chained, so he took my canoe, and said for me to wait till he come back or I could hunt around further, and maybe I better go down home and get them ready for the surprise if I wanted to. But I said I didn't, so I told him just how to find the raft, and then he started. I struck an idea pretty soon. I says to myself, supposing he can't fix that leg just in three shakes of a sheep's tail, as the saying is. Supposing it takes him three or four days. What are we going to do? Lay around there till he lets the cat out of the bag? No, sir, I know what I'll do. I'll wait, and when he comes back, if he says he's got to go any more, I'll get down there, too, if I swim, and we'll take and tie him, and keep him, and shove out down the river, and when Tom's done with him, we'll give him what it's worth, or all we got, and then let him get ashore. So then I crept into a lumber pile to get some sleep, and next time I waked up, the sun was away up over my head. I shot out and went for the doctor's house, but they told me he'd gone away in the night some time or other, and weren't back yet. Well, thinks I, that looks powerful bad for Tom, and I'll dig out for the island right off. So away I shoved, and turned the corner, and nearly ran my head into Uncle Silas's stomach. He says, oh, Why, Tom, where you been all this time, you rascal? I ain't been nowheres. I says, only just hunting for the runaway nigger, me and Sid. Why, wherever did you go? He says, your aunt's been mighty uneasy. She needn't, I says, because we was all right. We followed the men and the dogs, but they outrun us, and we lost them. But we thought we heard them on the water, so we got a canoe and took out after them and crossed over, but couldn't find nothing of them. So we cruised along up shore till we got kind of tired and beat out, and tied up the canoe and went to sleep, and never waked up until about an hour ago. Then we paddled over here to hear the news, and Sid's at the post office to see what he can hear, and I'm a-branching out to get something to eat for us, and then we're going home. So then we went to the post office to get Sid, but just as I suspicioned, he weren't there. So the old man he got a letter out of the office, and we waited a while longer, but Sid didn't come. So the old man said, Come along, let Sid foot it home, or canoe it, when he got done fooling around. But we would ride. I couldn't get him to let me stay and wait for Sid, and he said there weren't no use in it, and I must come along, and let Aunt Sally see we was all right. When we got home, Aunt Sally was that glad to see me, she laughed and cried both, and hugged me, and give me one of them lickings of hern that don't amount to shucks, and said she'd serve Sid the same when he come. 
and the place was plumb full of farmers and farmers' wives to dinner, and such another clack a body never heard. Old Mrs. Hotchkiss was the worst. Her tongue was a goin all the time. She says, "Well, Sister Phelps, I ransacked that air cabin over, and I believe the nigger was crazy." I says to Sister Damrell, didn't I, Sister Damrell? Says I, he's crazy, says I. Them's the very words I said. You all heard me, he's crazy, says I. Everything shows it, says I. Look at that air grindstone, says I. Want to tell me it any creature in his right mind is going to scrabble all them crazy things onto a grindstone, says I. Here's such and such a person busted his heart and here so-and-so pegged along for thirty-seven year, and all that, natural son of Louis somebody, and such everlasting rubbage. He's plumb crazy, says I. It's what I says in the first place, it's what I says in the middle, and it's what I says last and all the time. The nigger's crazy. Crazy never could neither, says I. And look at that air ladder made out of rags, Sister Hotchkiss, says old Mrs. Damrell. Why in the name of goodness could he ever want of? The very words I was a-saying no longer go this minute to Sister Utterback, and she'll tell you so herself. Says she, look at that air rag ladder, says she, and says I, yes, look at it, says I. What could he a wanted of it, says I, says she, Sister Hotchkiss, says she. But how in the nation they ever get that grindstone in there anyway? And who dug that air hole? And who? My very words, Brer Penrod. I was a saying, pass that air sasser of molasses, won't you? I was a saying to Sister Dunlap just this minute. How did they get that grindstone in there? Says I, without help, mind you, without help. That's where it is. Don't tell me, says I. There was help, says I, and there was a plenty help too, says I. There been a dozen helpin' that nigger, and I lay I'd skin every last nigger on this place, but I'd find out who done it, says I. And moreover, says I, a dozen, says you. Forty couldn't a done everything that's been done. Look at them case knife saws and things. How tedious they've been made. Look at that bed leg sawed off with em a week's work for six men look at that nigger made out of straw on the bed and look at well you may say it brer hightower it's just as i was saying to brer phelps his own self says he what do you think of it sister hotchkiss says he think of what brer phelps says i think of that bed leg sawed off that away says he think of it says i i lay it never sawed itself off says i somebody sawed it says i that's my opinion take it or leave it it may be no count says i but such as it is it's my opinion says i and if anybody can start a better one says i let him do it says i that's all i says to sister dunlap says i why dog my cats there must have been a house full of niggers in there every night for four weeks to a done all that work sister phelps look at that shirt every last inch of it covered over with secret african writing done with blood must have been a raft of em at it right along all the time almost why i'd give two dollars to have it read to me and as for the niggers that wrote it i'd low i'd take and lash em until people to help him brother marples well, I reckon you'd think so if you'd have been in this house for a while back. Why, they stole everything they could lay their hands on, and we a watchin' all the time, mind you. They stole that shirt right off of the line, and as for that sheet, they made the rag ladder out of. There ain't no tellin' how many times they didn't steal that, and flour, and candles, and candlesticks and spoons, and the old warming-pan, and most a thousand things that I disremember now, and my new calico dress, and me and Silas and my Sid and Tom on the constant watch day and night, as I was a-tellin' you, and not a one of us could catch hide nor hair, nor sight nor sound of them, and here, at the last minute, lo and behold you, they slides right in under our noses and fools us and not only fools us, but the Injun Territory robbers, too, and actually gets away with that nigger safe and sound, 
and that with sixteen men and twenty-two dogs right on their very heels at that very time. I tell you, it just bangs anything I ever heard of. Why, spirits couldn't have done better and been no smarter. And I reckon they must have been spirits, because you know our dogs, and there ain't no better. Well, them dogs never even got on the track of em once. You explain that to me if you can, any of you. Well, it does be laws alive, I never— So help me, I wouldn't have be house thieves as well as— Limb this gracious sakes, I'd have been afeard to live in such a— Afraid to live? Why, I was that scared I doesn't hardly go to bed, or get up, or lay down, or set down, Sister Ridgeway. Why, they'd steal the very—why, goodness sakes, you can guess what kind of a fluster I was in by the time midnight come last night. I hoped to gracious if I weren't afraid they'd steal some of the family. I was just to that pass I didn't have no reasoning faculties no more. It looks foolish enough now, in the daytime, but I says to myself, there's my two poor boys asleep way upstairs in that lonesome room, and I declare to goodness I was that uneasy that I crept up there and locked em in. I did, and anybody would. Because, you know, when you get scared that way, and it keeps running on, and getting worse and worse all the time, and your wits get to addlin', and you get to doing all sorts of wild things, and by and by you think to yourself, supposing I was a boy, and was away up there, and the door ain't locked, and you—' She stopped, looking kind of wondering, and then she turned her head around slow, and when her eye lit on me— I got up and took a walk. Says I to myself, I can't explain better how we come to not be in that room this morning if I go out to one side and study over it a little. So I done it. But I dasn't go fur or she'd a sent for me. And when it was late in the day the people all went, and when I come in and told her the noise and shooting waked up me and Sid, and the door was locked and we wanted to see the fun. So we went down the lightning rod, and both of us got hurt a little, and we didn't never want to try that no more. And then I went on and told her all what I told Uncle Silas before, and then she said she'd forgive us, and maybe it was all right enough anyway, and about what a body might expect of boys, for all boys was a pretty harem scarum lot as fur as she could see. And so, as long as no harm hadn't come of it, she judged she better put in her time being grateful we was alive and well, and she had us still, stead of fretting over what was past and done. So then she kissed me, and patted me on the head, and dropped into a kind of a brown study, and pretty soon jumps up, and says, "'Why, laws the mercy, it's most night, and Sid not come yet. What has become of that boy?' I see my chance, so I skips up and says, "'I'll run right up to town and get him,' I says. "'No, you won't,' she says. "'You'll stay right where you are. One's enough to be lost at a time. If he ain't here to supper, your uncle'll go.' Well, he weren't there to supper, so right after supper uncle went. He come back about ten a little bit uneasy, hadn't run across Tom's track. Aunt Sally was a good deal uneasy. But Uncle Silas, he said there won't no occasion to be. Boys will be boys, he said, and you'll see this one turn up in the morning all sound and right. So she had to be satisfied, but she said she'd set up for him a while anyway, and keep a light burning so he could see it. And then when I went up to bed she come up with me, and fetched her candle and tucked me in, and mothered me so good I felt mean and like I couldn't look her in the face. And she sat down on the bed and talked with me a long time, and said what a splendid boy Sid was, and didn't seem to want to ever stop talking about him. He kept asking me every now and then if I reckon he could have got lost or hurt or maybe drowned. He might be laying at this minute somewhere suffering or dead, and she not by him to help him, and so the tears would drip down silent and I would tell her that Sid was all right, and would be home in the morning, sure, and she would squeeze my hand, or maybe kiss me, 
and tell me to say it again, and keep on saying it, because it done her good, and she was in so much trouble. And when she was going away, she looked down in my eyes so steady and gentle, and says, The door ain't going to be locked, Tom, and there's the window and the rod, but you'll be good, won't you? And you won't go? For my sake. Laws knows I wanted to go bad enough to see about Tom, and was all intending to go, but after that I wouldn't a went, not for kingdoms. But she was on my mind, and Tom was on my mind, so I slept very restless, and twice I went down the rod away in the night, and slipped around front, and see her settin' there by her candle in the window, with her eyes towards the road, and the tears in them and I wished I could do something for her, but I couldn't, only to swear that I would not never do nothing to grieve her any more. And the third time I waked up at dawn, and slid down, and she was there yet, and her candle was most out, and her old gray head was resting on her hand, and she was asleep. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 42 The old man was uptown again before breakfast, but couldn't get no track of Tom and both of them sat at the table thinking, and not saying nothing, and looking mournful, and their coffee getting cold, and not eating anything. And by and by the old man says, Did I give you the letter? What letter? The one I got yesterday out of the post office. No, you didn't give me no letter. Well, I, I must have forgot it. So he rummaged his pockets, and then went off somewheres where he had laid it down, and fetched it and give it to her. She says, "'Why, it's from St. Petersburg. It's from Sis.' I allowed another walk would do me good, but I couldn't stir. But before she could break it open she dropped it and run, for she sees something. And so did I. It was Tom Sawyer on a mattress, and that old doctor and Jim in her calico dress with his hands tied behind him, and a lot of people. I hid the letter behind the first thing that come handy, and rushed. She flung herself at Tom, crying, and says, Oh, he's dead, he's dead, I know he's dead. And Tom, he turned his head a little, and muttered something or other, which showed he warn't in his right mind. Then she flung up her hands, and says, He's alive, thank God, and that's enough and she snatched a kiss of him, and flew for the house to get the bed ready, and scattering orders right and left at the niggers and everybody else as fast as her tongue could go, every jump of the way. I followed the men to see what they was going to do with Jim, and the old doctor and Uncle Silas followed after Tom into the house. The men was very huffy, and some of them wanted to hang Jim for an example to all the other niggers around there so they wouldn't be trying to run away like Jim done, and making such a raft of trouble, keeping a whole family scared most to death for days and nights. But the others said, Don't do it. It wouldn't answer at all. He ain't our nigger, and his owner would turn up and make us pay for him, sure. So that cooled them down a little, because the people that's always the most anxious for to hang a nigger that hain't done just right is always the very ones that ain't the most anxious to pay for em when they've got their satisfaction out of him. They cussed Jim considerable, though, and give him a cuff or two side the head once in a while. But Jim never said nothing, and he never let on to know me. And they took him to the same cabin, and put his own clothes on him, and chained him again, not to no bed-leg this time, but to a big staple drove into the bottom log and chained his hands, too, and both legs, and said he weren't to have nothing but bread and water to eat after this till his owner come, 
or he was sold at auction because he didn't come in a certain length of time, and filled up our hole, and said a couple of farmers with guns must stand watch around about the cabin every night, and a bulldog tied to the door in the daytime. And about this time they was through with the job and was tapering off with a kind of general good-bye cussin. Then the old doctor comes and takes a look and says, don't be no rougher on him than you're obliged to, because he ain't a bad nigger. When I got to where I found the boy, I see I couldn't cut the bullet out without some help, and he warn't no condition for me to leave to go and get help. And he got a little worse and a little worse, and after a long time he went out of his head, and wouldn't let me come anigh him any more, and said if I chalked his raft he'd kill me, and no end of wild foolishness like that and I see I couldn't do anything at all with him, so I says, I got to have help somehow, and the minute I says it, out crawls this nigger from somewheres and says, he'll help, and he done it too, and done it very well. Of course I judged he must be a runaway nigger, and there I was, and there I had to stick right straight along all through the rest of the day and all night. It was a fix, I tell you. I had a couple of patients with the chills, and of course I'd have liked to run up to town and see them, but I dasn't, because the nigger might get away, and then I'd be to blame, and yet never a skiff come close enough for me to hail. So there I had to stick plumb until daylight this morning, and I never see a nigger that was a better nuss or a faithfuller, and yet he was risking his freedom to do it, and was all tired out too, and I see plain enough he'd worked mean hard lately. I like the nigger for that. I tell you, gentlemen, a nigger like that is worth a thousand dollars, and kind treatment, too. I had everything I needed, and the boy was doing as well there as he would have done at home. Better, maybe, because it was so quiet. But there I was, with both of them on my hands, and there I had to stick till about dawn this morning. Then some men in a skiff come by, and as good luck would have it, the nigger was settin' by the pallet with his head propped on his knees, sound asleep. So I motioned them in quiet, and they slipped up on him and grabbed him and tied him before he knowed what he was about, and we never had no trouble. And the boy been in a kind of a flighty sleep, too, we muffled the oars and hitched the raft on and towed her over very nice and quiet, and the nigger never made the least row nor said a word from the start. He ain't no bad nigger, gentlemen. That's what I think about him. Somebody says, Well, it sounds very good, doctor, I'm obliged to say. Then the others softened up a little, too, and I was mighty thankful to that old doctor for doing Jim that good turn, and I was glad it was according to my judgment of him, too, because I thought he had a good heart in him, and was a good man the first time I see him. Then they all agreed that Jim had acted very well and was deserving to have some notice took of it and reward. So every one of them promised, right out and hearty, that they wouldn't cuss him no more. Then they come out and locked him up. I was hoping they was going to say he could have one or two of the chains took off, because they was rotten heavy, or could have meat and greens with his bread and water, but they didn't think of it, and I reckon it weren't best for me to mix in but I judged I'd get the doctor's yarn to Aunt Sally somehow or other as soon as I got through the breakers that was laying just ahead of me. Explanations, I mean, of how I forgot to mention about Sid being shot when I was telling how him and me put in that dratted night paddling round hunting the runaway nigger. But I had plenty time. Aunt Sally, she stuck to the sick room all day and all night, and every time I see Uncle Silas mooning around, I dodged him. Next morning I heard Tom was a good deal better, and they said Aunt Sally was gone to get a nap. So I slips to the sick room, and if I found him awake I reckoned we could put up a yarn for the family that would wash. But he was sleeping, sleeping very peaceful, too, and pale, not fire-faced the way he was when he come. So I sat down and laid for him to wake. In about half an hour Aunt Sally comes gliding in, and there I was, up a stump again. She motioned me to be still, and sat down by me, and begun to whisper, and said we could all be joyful now, because all the symptoms was first-rate, 
and he'd been sleeping like that for ever so long, and looking better and peacefuller all the time, and ten to one he'd wake up in his right mind. So we sat there watching, and by and by he stirs a bit, and opens his eyes very natural, takes a look and says, Hello! Why, I'm at home! How's that? Where's the raft? It's all right, I says. And Jim? The same, I says, but I couldn't say it pretty brash. But he never noticed, but says, Good! Splendid! Now we're all right and safe. Did you tell Annie? I was going to say yes, but she chipped in and says, About what, Sid? Why, about the way the whole thing was done. What whole thing? Why, the whole thing. There ain't but one. How we set the runaway nigger free, me and Tom? Good land! Set the run? What is the child talking about? Dear, dear, out of his head again. No, I ain't out of my head. I know all what I'm talking about. We did set him free, me and Tom. We laid out to do it, and we done it. And we done it elegant, too. He got a start, and she never checked him up, just sat and stared and stared and let him clip along, and I see it warn't no use for me to put in. Why, Annie, it costs us a power of work, weeks of it, hours and hours every night, whilst you was all asleep, and we had to steal candles and the sheet and the shirt and your dress, and spoons and tin plates and case knives and the warming pan and the grindstone and flour and just no end of things, and you can't think what work it was to make the saws and pens and inscriptions in one thing or another. You can't think half the fun it was. And we had to make up the pictures of coffins and things, anonymous letters from the robbers, and get up and down the lightning rod, and dig the hole into the cabin, and made the rope ladder, and sent it in cooked up in a pie, and send in spoons and things to work with in your apron pocket. Mercy sakes! and load up the cabin with rats and snakes and so on for company for jim and then you kept tom here so long with the butter in his hat that you come near spilin the whole business because the men come before we was out of the cabin and we had to rush and they hurt us and let drive at us and i got my share and we dodged out of the path and let them go by and when the dogs come they weren't interested in us but went for the most noise and we got our canoe and made for the raft, and was all safe, and Jim was a free man, and we done it all by ourselves. And wasn't it bully, Auntie? Well, I never heard the likes of it in all my born days. So it was you, you little rapscallions, that's been making all this trouble, and turned everybody's wits clean inside out, and scared us all most to death. I've as good a notion as ever I had in my life to take it out of you this very minute. To think, here I've been, night after night, and you just get well once, you young scamp, and I lay I'll tan the old Harry out of both of you. But Tom, he was so proud and joyful, he just couldn't hold in, and his tongue just went it, she a-chippin' in and spittin' fire all along and both of them going it at once, like a cat convention, and she says, "'Well, you get all the enjoyment you can out of it now, for mind I tell you if I catch you meddling with him again—' "'Meddling with who?' Tom says, dropping his smile and looking surprised. "'With who? Why, the runaway nigger, of course. Who'd you reckon?' Tom looks at me very grave, and says, Tom, didn't you just tell me he was all right? Hasn't he got away? Him, said Aunt Sally. The runaway nigger? Deed he hasn't. They got him back, safe and sound, and he's in that cabin again, on bread and water, and loaded down with chains till he's claimed or sold. Tom rose square up in bed, with his eye hot, and his nostrils opening and shutting like gills, and sings out to me. They ain't no right to shut him up. Shove! And don't you lose a minute. Turn him loose. He ain't no slave. He's as free as any creature that walks this earth. What does the child mean? I mean every word I say, Aunt Sally, and if somebody don't go, I'll go. I've knowed him all his life, and so is Tom there. 
Old Miss Watson died two months ago, and she was ashamed she ever was going to sell him down the river, and said so, and she set him free in her will. Then what on earth did you want to set him free for, sin he was already free? Well, that is a question, I must say, and just like women. Why, I wanted the adventure of it, and I'd a waited neck deep in blood to— Goodness alive! Aunt Polly! If she weren't standing right there, just inside the door, looking as sweet and contented as an angel half full of pie, I wish I may never— Aunt Sally jumped for her, and most hugged the head off of her, and cried over her, and I found a good enough place for me under the bed, for it was getting pretty sultry for us, seemed to me. And I peeped out, and in a little while Tom's Aunt Polly shook herself loose and stood there, looking across at Tom over her spectacles, kind of grinding him into the earth, you know. And then she says, "'Yes, you better turn your head away. I would if I was you, Tom.' "'Oh, dearie me,' says Aunt Sally. "'Is he changed so? Why, that ain't Tom. It's Sid. Tom's—Tom's—' Tom's. Why, where is Tom? He was here a minute ago. You mean where's Huck Finn? That's what you mean. I reckon I hain't raised such a scamp as my Tom all these years not to know him when I see him. That would be a pretty howdy-do. Come out from under that bed, Huck Finn. So I done it, but not feeling brash. Aunt Sally, she was one of the mixed-uppest-looking persons I ever see except one, and that was Uncle Silas, when he come in, and they told it all to him. It kind of made him drunk, as you may say, and he didn't know nothing at all the rest of the day, and preached a prayer-meeting sermon that night that gave him a rattling reputation, because the oldest man in the world couldn't have understood it. So Tom's Aunt Polly, she told all about who I was and what, and I had to up and tell how I was in such a tight place that when Mrs. Phelps took me for Tom Sawyer, she chipped in and says, Oh, go on and call me Aunt Sally. I'm used to it now, and tain't no need to change. That when Aunt Sally took me for Tom Sawyer, I had to stand it. There wa not no other way. And I knowed he wouldn't mind, because it would be nuts for him, being a mystery, and he'd make an adventure out of it, and be perfectly satisfied. And so it turned out, and he let on to be Sid, and made things as soft as he could for me. And his Aunt Polly, she said Tom was right about old Miss Watson setting Jim free in her will. And so, sure enough, Tom Sawyer had gone and took all that trouble and bother to set a free nigger free. And I could never understand before, until that minute and that talk, how he could help a body set a nigger free with his bringing up. Well... Aunt Polly, she said that when Aunt Sally wrote to her that Tom and Sid had come all right and safe, she says to herself, Look at that now. I might have expected it, letting him go off that way without anybody to watch him. So now I got to go and traipse all the way down the river, eleven hundred mile, and find out what that creature's up to this time, as long as I couldn't seem to get any answer out of you about it. "'Why, I never heard nothing from you,' says Aunt Sally. "'Well, I wonder why I wrote you twice to ask you what you could mean by Sid being here. "'Well, I never got him, sis.' Aunt Polly, she turns around slow and severe, and says, "'You, Tom.' "'Well, what?' he says, kind of pettish. "'Don't you what me, you impudent thing. Hand out them letters.' What letters? Them letters. I'd be bound if I have to take a hold of you, I'll— They're in the trunk. There now. And they're just the same as they was when I got them out of the office. I hain't looked into em, I hain't touched them, but I knowed they'd make trouble, and I thought if you weren't in no hurry, I'd— Well, you do need skinning. There ain't no mistake about it. And I wrote another one to tell you I was coming, and I suppose he— No, it come yesterday. I hain't read it yet, but it's all right. I've got that one. I wanted to offer to bet two dollars she hadn't, but I reckon maybe it was just as safe to not to. So I never said nothing. End of chapter.
This here is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter The Last That means the last chapter. The first time I catched Tom Private I asked him what was his idea, time of the evasion, what it was he planned to do if the evasion worked all right and he managed to set a nigger free that was already free before, and he said what he had planned in his head from the start if we got Jim out all safe, was for us to run him down the river on the raft, and have adventures plumb to the mouth of the river, and then tell him about his being free, and take him back up home on a steamboat in style, and pay him for his lost time, and write word ahead and get out all the niggers around, and have them waltz him into town with a torchlight procession and a brass band, and then he would be a hero, and so would we but I reckon it was about as well the way it was. We had Jim out of the chains in no time, and when Aunt Polly and Uncle Silas and Aunt Sally found out how good he helped the doctor nurse Tom, they made a heap of fuss over him, and fixed him up prime, and gave him all he wanted to eat, and a good time and nothing to do. And we had him up to the sick room, and had a high talk, and Tom give Jim forty dollars for being prisoner for us so patient, and doing it up so good, and Jim was pleased most to death, and busted out and says, "'There now, Huck, what I tell you, what I tell you up there in Jackson Island, I told you I got a hairy breast, and what's the sign of it? And I told you I've been rich once, and going to be rich again, and it's come true, and here she is.' "'There now! Don't talk to me. Signs is signs. Mind, I tell you, and I know just as well as I's going to be rich again as I's a standin' here this minute.' And then Tom he talked along and talked along and says, "'Let's all three slide out of here one of these nights and get an outfit and go for howlin' adventures amongst the Injuns over in the Territory for a couple of weeks or two. And I says, all right, that suits me, but I ain't got no money for to buy the outfit, and I reckon I couldn't get none from home, because it's likely Pap's been back before now and got it all away from Judge Thatcher and drunk it up. No, he ain't, Tom says. It's all there yet, six thousand dollars and more, and your Pap ain't ever been back since. Hadn't when I come away, anyhow. Jim says, kind of solemn, he ain't a coming back no more, Huck. I says, Why, Jim? Never mind why, Huck, but he ain't coming back no more. But I kept at him, so at last he says, Don't you remember the house that was floating down the river? And there was a man in there covered up, and I went in and uncovered him and didn't let you come in? Well, then, you can get your money when you wants it. "'Cause dat was him. "'Tom's most well now, "'and got his bullet around his neck "'on a watch-guard for a watch, "'and is always seeing what time it is, "'and so there ain't nothing more to write about, "'and I am rotten glad of it, "'because if I'd a known what a trouble it was "'to make a book, I wouldn't a tackled it, "'and ain't a-going to no more. "'But I reckon I got to light out "'for the territory ahead of the rest,' because Aunt Sally, she's going to adopt me and civilize me, and I can't stand it. I've been there before. That's the end of this here book. Thanks for listening.